Good morning, everybody. Welcome this beautiful last day of March here in Florida and um, to our program today. Ooh, Karen, can you get those people in the waiting room, please? My arrow's yeah. acting a little goofy. Um, uh, welcome, everyone, to um, Common Mistakes That Are Made in the Landscape. The five common mistakes I'm going to talk about, but first of all, I'm going to introduce Karen Mojica from Hernando County Mosquito Control. Um, and she is with us to talk about some mosquito myths. So whether you are here in Central Florida or somewhere else, um, a lot of the mosquito information is the same and there's always something to learn. Um, for those of you looking for Dr. Lester, he was um, scheduled for this particular um, class, but um, his boss told him he had to go to another meeting. So, you know, got to listen to the boss. <laughs> so Karen and I will make it through and um, I'll let Karen um, go ahead with, she's just going to start a little bit with some mosquito myths. And then I will get into the uh, five. And of course, I never limit it to the number I say. So it'll be a little more than five uncommon um, landscaping mistakes. But go ahead, Miss Karen. All right. Well, thank you, Lily. Um, as Lily had said, my name is Karen. I'm with Hernando County Mosquito Control. Um, that is a department here within Hernando County uh, government. And our responsibility here is to keep our residents safe from mosquitoes. So I will start with our mosquito myths. Um, I believe I have three. So my first myth is that all mosquitoes carry diseases. And that is a myth. Um, not all mosquitoes carry diseases. Um, here in Hernando County, we have eight uh, that we monitor um, that could possibly carry viruses. So it's super important that we um, go out and we test and we make sure that these varieties are not carrying viruses. So um, there's a few ways we do that. We do that through our chicken program. Um, that shows if they've been bitten by a mosquito that is carrying a virus. And our other way is we set traps throughout the county. And in those traps, um, we bring in the samples and we test those to be certain that the mosquitoes in those areas are not carrying the diseases as well. The three we deal with here is Triple E, which is Eastern Equine Encephalitis, uh, St. Louis encephalitis and West Nile, um, we test for these. Uh, we've had some um, very good years. We very rarely see any signs um, in the last few years. So um, with that, um, I also, this is a fact, this screen is not, um, is not a myth, uh, that heartworm is also um, a disease that's carried in cats and dogs, and there are other uh, animals as well that can carry heartworm. And I just wanted to put this up there because uh, there are many mosquitoes in Hernando County that are capable of carrying heartworm. And I just, with the springtime here and the mosquito populations, of course, will be growing. Uh, I just wanted to do a reminder for everyone to make sure that you're protecting your pets. Um, so we have currently here in Hernando County, our state, the state of Florida has about 75 varieties of mosquitoes. Hernando County, we have about 40 different varieties that we monitor. Um, they live in different environments. They're not all the same. Uh, we have some that live by the water, some um, live in the woods. They all have different environments that they tend to um, produce in. So out of that 40, we do have the eight that carry the viruses, that have possibility of carrying the viruses. And then we have many that can transmit um, the heartworm to our pets. So we wanna make sure that we keep those, as you see in my slide here, it says that there's 22 varieties in the United States that can carry heartworm, but we don't have quite that many here in Hernando County. So I just wanted that back in there. Okay, fact number two is that that's eliminate mosquito populations. Um, and that is a, a myth. Um, although bats can assist in controlling some, they do not eliminate the mosquito populations. The testing um, where they first stated that bats do eliminate them was in a, 
controlled environment where that's all they had to eat. They were put in a room with only mosquitoes and so therefore they ate the mosquitoes. But in the natural environment, um, there's lots of bigger, more filling bugs than mosquitoes. So they will go for the larger of the bugs if they have their choice um, the menu. Um, and I did get that when they tested the bats, only about 1% of their diet is actually a mosquito uh, eaten bug. So they do help, but they do not eliminate our mosquito populations. So that was our myth number two. And then I'll go to our myth number three. Myth number three is that the spray truck will fix the problem. And that is, um, that is not the truth. Um, we do get a lot of calls. Uh, people just request the spray truck if they're having a mosquito problem and they feel that that's the solution to the problem, but in actuality, it's not. Um, we send that as our last resort. Um, the first thing we do is, is find where the problem is coming from. If mosquitoes are breeding in a tire that's dumped in the woods next door to you, and it's got a large population of larvae in there, then that truck may knock down the ones that have hatched and are flying, but that problem still exists and they're still continuing to hatch. So it's not gonna fix the problem. Um, it'll only knock down the existing flying ones that it, it actually comes in contact with. So whenever we get a call that um, residents are having a problem with a large mosquito population in their yard, um, which we do ask you to let us know if you're experiencing um, large mosquitoes. That's the way we can keep track of um, problem spots. So if you're having a problem and you're in Hernando County, uh, don't hesitate to give us a call. Um, and then we will send out our technicians and they'll do a walk around and see exactly where that breeding problem is coming from. Um, as you could see in the picture here is one of our guys. Uh, we do have a lot of swampy areas here in Hernando County. Um, so it could be something to that effect where we have a population there um, and something like that is gonna breed a lot. We do have solutions to that that is not a spray truck. Um, we do, uh, we have a fish program, which we distribute fish into our areas that continually hold water. Uh, we can also distribute the fish, the fish to our homeowners who may have a small lake on their property. Um, they may have a large animal troughs. They may have um, a decorative pond, a decorative water feature. Um, those still waters, um, if they're not moving, will definitely be a breeding spot for mosquitoes. So if you have any of those locations on your property, we ask that you give us a call and we'll be more than happy uh, to bring out some fish for you. They're only about an inch long. They're similar to a guppy. They um, mass produce very well. So when we stock a pond, we may only have, need to put say a dozen of them in there, but they will uh, definitely continue to produce in that area. We do sometimes have problems where you know, the food chain comes along and either birds or larger fish or turtles, they will eat them. So we do need to restock from time to time. So that's why we ask if you uh, do have any bodies of water on your properties to give us a call and we'll, we have a breeding tank here at our office. So we're continually um, having new stock to distribute. Um, you can see in my photo here, there's a few other reasons for uh, breeding problems of, that the truck will not fix. And some of that is not even seen. Sometimes your gutters are clogged. You don't see that the water sitting in there, uh, creating an ideal environment. Um, tires that you may not even know may be there in a, a lot next door. Um, ten, there's a tendency sometimes where people just dump them and uh, don't realize the perfect environment they're creating for mosquitoes to breed in. And unfortunately, the ones that breed in that environment do have the capabilities of carrying diseases. So um, it's real important that discarded tires, um, if they're your personal tires, either cover them, uh, keep them inside 
I mean, if someone has just uh, disposed of them and dumped them on, on the road, we wanna make sure that we get them and clean them up because um, it is a potential uh, problem site. So we also treat our uh, still water areas such as the um, swampy areas. We use uh, a very natural product. It's a bacterial, natural bacterial product. So it only affects the mosquito larvae. Um, and it just prevents them from hatching into a flying adult. So we can treat an area that uh, it's, it would be safe for birds, other, uh, it'll be safe for fish, animals, they can still um, safely drink from any of the waters that we put the treatment in, but it will um, eliminate the mosquito from hatching. So we try our very best to do as many natural um, products that we can or natural solutions that we can use to avoid sending out the spray truck. I think back in the day that used to be, I remember hearing a lot of people talk about uh, being a kid and chasing after the spray truck. Um, so we don't, we, we do send it out when needed. I'm not, I'm not saying we don't send out the truck, but that's our last resort. Uh, we try to do every other angle before we need to send out the truck. And, um, and then I put in another fact. Um, the fact is, is that uh, mosquitoes need water in order to, um, to breed. So that female mosquito is the one that's the biter. She needs that blood meal from when she bites you in order to create her eggs. Um, the male mosquitoes don't bite, uh, they eat nectar, they're good pollinators. Um, so the female mosquito will, will bite, uh, then she will use that protein and lay her eggs either in the water, on the water, next to the water, uh, depending on the, the species. Uh, they will hatch into those little wiggly things that you usually see in the bottom of the flower pots, um, a bucket that may have been left outside. Um, that's where they go to lay those eggs so that you'll see those little wiggly guys and they'll hatch. Um, they go through a, a couple of days of, of that hatching process from a larvae to a pupae and then once they finish their hatching process, then they submerge out of the water into a flying adult. And then they in turn do the same process. So uh, you get one bucket of water or an old wheelbarrow or something out in the yard and they will just continue to produce more and more making your environment very um, not enjoyable. So in order to prevent the mosquito breeding in your yard to keep your yard a more friendly um, environment. You want to eliminate any standing water. This can happen in the summer days. It can take as short as four days for those uh, larvae, to, those eggs to hatch into a flying adult. So if you have a bird bath, um, watering cans, things like that that you use uh, in your yard, you want to clean those out at least, uh, I'd say every four days in the summer. Um, and use, if you're using a bird bath, use a little brush because the, the eggs tend to cling to the side. Um, so even if you're hosing it out, you'll still still stick there. So just brush it out a little bit and that'll keep the mosquitoes from breeding in your bird bath. Um, there's a few other spots that are kind of hidden. You know, you, your bromeliads, that's another big, um, big breeding spot. Most of our guys that call, get called out, especially here, it's like, here we go. Um, this time of year, the um, our technicians get called out because people are starting to see a lot of mosquitoes and bromeliads are one of the first um, problem spots, you might want to say. They're a plant that kind of is stocky and it has little pockets, almost like little cones in the center. And then you get that beautiful flower that comes out. Um, that's a really common spot for the mosquitoes to lay their, their eggs. You have Okay, so if you have bromeliads, you wanna hose them out, use maybe granule products that you can find in the, in the um, big box stores. They sell granules to sprinkle into those to prevent that larvae from hatching. That's part of that biological product that I was telling you about that really won't affect anything else other than that mosquito. So you wanna check your bromeliads, check your basis of your flower pots, things that could possibly hold that water to keep your environment um, 
more enjoyable for your gardening pleasures. Um, the second thing too, okay, sorry, my phone just rang, it's going off. Um, the other thing too, is if you are experiencing a mosquito problem, you wanna um, give us a call. We're on Facebook. You can go there. You can go to our website, which I will show you on our next screen. Um, and you can put in a service request. Um, if you give us a call, I will be happy to take that request for you. Um, and that's just a way, there are times where you don't see where they're coming from. I'm sorry. You don't see where they're coming from, but we, we're, our guys are trying to find that for you. And um, give us a call, put in that information, and we'll be happy to, to take care of your yard for you. There is no charge for us to come out. This is part of our uh, keeping our Hernando County safe, um, keeping our residents safe from diseases and, and testing mosquitoes. So if you're having, and Lily, I think I'm gonna pass this to you because my system keeps going out. Give us a call okay. and we'll be happy to take care of it for you. Um, our phone number's here and our email is here. And again, my name is Karen. Hope I didn't talk too fast. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Um, now I need you to stop sharing yeah. so that I am able to share. There we go. Let's see if I can get mine. Okay, um, can everybody see that? Uh, is everyone able to see that one? Uh, Karen, can you see my, my screen share? I can. I see your whole um, PowerPoint, but I'm not sure if it's just me. Okay. All right. Now I have lost it, so let me try it. <laughs> there it is. Okay, so I assume everyone can see it. Uh, let me let people in the room. I got and, that. Okay, thank you. And Karen, if you just, if there's something goes wrong with it, because I'm not seeing much of anything right now, um, let me know, just break in and let me know. But um, thank you for sharing those mosquito myths. Now we're gonna start with the five common gardening mistakes, at least here in central Florida. And um, here, I'll put the chat up. So I'm not seeing it, Lily. You're not, okay. Let me see. So you still don't see that, huh? I just, oh, okay, how's that? I'm not seeing different. No, I just still have it on the first one. You see that, five common gardening mistakes? Yeah. Okay, now you see my name. Yes. No. You can see it or not? I still see your whole PowerPoint screen. The, what, the what you're supposed to see, right? The Not just the pictures. I see the whole oh, thing. Oh, okay. Um, let me try it a different way then. All right. Let's see. I think what's happening is because I have this, um, this second monitor open and that kind of messes things up a little bit for me. Let's start all over again. Okay, up in this one. There, can you see that now? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, let's get started. And then you can see my name, right? <laughs> okay. Yes. All right. I am Lily Browning. I do work for Hernando County Utilities here in um, Central Florida in Hernando County. Um, I am the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator. Below is my email, and at the end, I'll have both mine and Karen's emails, so if you have questions for us. And if Karen, Karen, there were some questions for you in the chat, so um, if you want to try and answer those while I'm talking, that will help expedite time for us. Um, there, This is being recorded, so therefore, if you have a friend who missed it or you want to go back and uh, listen to it again, it'll be on my Facebook page which I'll have the link in a little bit um, later this afternoon. And within a week or so, it'll be on Hernando County Government YouTube. So let your friends know about that who might happen to be missing this. 
Here are the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. Everything I do and everything I teach is going to pertain to one or more of these principles. Um, this program was developed by the University of Florida. Uh, basically, if to accomplish a lot of things, and one of them wraps up in number nine, is to protect the waterfront. But it's also um, to teach citizens how to have a beautiful yet sustainable landscape in Florida. And we are going to cover in today's class uh, principles number one, right plant, right place. Number two, water efficiently. Number three, fertilize appropriately. And number six, manage yard pests responsibly. I shouldn't have said we're gonna cover them. We're going to touch on them because each of them could be several hours long um, in themselves. These five mistakes, um, common mistakes, I got right out of this Florida friendly, I have to put it up against me so you can see it. Uh, uh, plant selection, Florida friendly landscaping, plant selection and design guide. Fantastic book. These uh, common mistakes I got right off of page 28. So if you have this book and you wanted to follow up, you can look on page 28 and I will tell you in a little bit, if you don't have one of these, how you can get one. But the number one thing, and this is um, very important, this is why I work for the water department, or I should say why the water department um, took my position before I had it. <laughs> they incorporated this position because it works very, very well under water conservation. Here in Hernando County, we, uh, you know, 60% of the water that we deliver, people put right on their lawns. So people have a misunderstanding of how much water the lawn needs. Even people who have been here for quite some time, we think the solution to every lawn problem, the number, the first thing we think of is we need to water it more, and I'll kind of get into that too. But overwatering is probably the number one problem. A lot of people who never had an irrigation system up north move down here and they just think it's a thing. It's a thing you have to do. You have to irrigate, um, just like you, you have to get pest control for your home. And you know, many of us who have lived here for very many years don't do either of those things. That might come as a surprise to you. Um, and we got something resembling a lawn outside and we don't have bugs you know, running all over our house. Um, overwatering, if we think the solution to every lawn problem is to water it more, what that does, there's only so much the lawn's going to take up. And it creates more pest and disease problems than it solves, not to mention, mention wasting water. And if you are, are on a municipal water system, that costs you money. But that extra water, when it, you know, can't your, the grass has no capacity of taking it up. Your landscape plants have no capacity of taking it up anymore. It's either gonna leach down into our very sandy soil and um, end up in the groundwater, which may or may not be a good thing. If it's gonna take pollutants with it, then that's a bad thing. Or it's gonna run off, run down all these uh, concrete sidewalks, all the asphalt roads, picking up all the pollutants it can find, um, ending up in a storm drain and taking it to the nearest waterway. We want our landscape to be able to absorb the water that we put on it and not just throw a whole bunch out there hoping it'll do the lawn some good. Now, a lot of people ask me, how long should I put on each irrigation zone? And that is actually the wrong question. <laughs> Um, because we have no way of answering that. We don't know your water pressure. We don't know exactly what kind of heads you have in each zone or you know all these varying things, even what kind of lawn you may have. So if you have a Floritam, often Floritam is a very common variety of St. Augustine in our area here in Central Florida. We think it needs more than it does really only needs half an inch to three quarters of an inch of water per watering event. That um, little half inch, what it's gonna do is water down 
about eight inches. So beyond that, what are you watering? You're watering nothing. That is, you know, if you have a really good root system, um, it's, it's hitting the roots there. If you water it more often and it, um, but for less, you know, less amount, you have a shallow root system. You want to water less but deeper so that it encourages a deep root system so that those roots are going deep, 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 deep into the soil. Um, and how do you, you probably asking me, how the heck do I know I am watering a half an inch? I can measure time, I can measure half an hour. How do I measure half an inch? There's a real simple way to do that. You see these tuna cans out here on this lawn? Put some around, measure half an inch, measure three quarters of an inch, whichever one you like, inside with a Sharpie, inside each can, place them randomly. These cans are, this is for a demonstration purpose. You don't need to put them that close together. Space them out you know, in each zone, watch it, see how long it takes up to fill the cans to three quarters of an inch. If that took 20 minutes, write down zone one, 20 minutes. If that took 45 minutes, write down zone one, 45 minutes. Do that for each zone, then go out, go into your um, control box and set each zone for that amount of time. It's not an exact science, but it is probably better than what you've got going on now. And, you know, we hear all the time that lawns are a big waste of water. Um, no lawn that I am aware of has ever, you know, inched its way up into a garage and turned on that irrigation system. <laughs> Who is the waste of water? We're, we're the water wasters. Um, and I wore my new water shirt today, uh, you know, just for this <laughs> event. Um, again, it's back to humans. We're the ones who waste water. Every plant is going to use exactly the amount that it needs to in order to, you know, to thrive. Everything else is a waste and we're the ones who are wasting it. If you have Bahia grass, you don't have St. Augustine grass, you can put the same amount out, won't hurt it. But the thing with Bahia grass is you don't have to. It's a pretty tough grass and it can survive once it's established on natural rainfall. If you're in a community that you know, has really high standards, then go ahead and you know, water it, um, keep it looking nice. But you don't have to, it's gonna come back after every rain, after every dry spill. And just because it's your watering day doesn't mean you have to set that system to go out and water. Maybe your lawn doesn't need it. We should all have rain sensors, operating rain sensors that will turn um, the system off if it's had enough rain. But also your lawn can talk to you, believe it or not, even though it can't go turn your irrigation system on, it can communicate with you. And one of the ways it does that is the blades will fold in half. If over 50% of your lawn has blades kind of folded in half like that, it's trying to conserve water and photosynthesize less so that <clears throat> it can save water. Or if you walk across it and you see here, like your footprints remain for a while, it's getting a little dehydrated. That's not panic time. Neither of these things are panic time and, and to disobey our uh, watering restrictions or whatever yours are, wherever your, you, you are, it is time to say, okay, the next time the watering day comes around, I'll go ahead and give you some water if nature doesn't do that for us in the meantime. You'll save yourself a lot of money and you'll save a lot of water and you'll save too much watering. As we mentioned, it's going to encourage disease. It's going to, um, encourage weeds. It's going to encourage a lot of problems that you don't want to have. So the lawns are not the water wasters. We are. But get to know that irrigation system. Um, not too long ago, I know because I'm only adjusting to it, we had a time change. You went around, you know, you changed all the clocks. Did you change your irrigation clock out there in the garage? That could be very important. I know someone 
um, I went to go see, help her with her irrigation system. And um, she got cited here in Hernando County because um, they have, it, your system has to be off um, by eight in the morning. And it was on at 8.30 because she hadn't changed that clock. And, you know, they didn't, you don't get any like warnings. If they catch you violating, then they're going to cite you. If you can't figure out your, your time clock, if it didn't, if the directions didn't come with it when you bought the house, if they have disappeared into the oblivion, like many things do, look at, look at your clock, see what um, brand it is, see, you know, what style, you know, get all the numbers from it. Everything's online. You can find your manual for it online and um, probably even some YouTube videos to teach you how to handle it. Your irrigation system isn't kind of a set it and forget it type thing. You really need to be out there often because it's on when you're asleep. So during the day, you want to be checking on it. If you have a broken sprinkler head like this, you know, this old faithful um, is wasting you a lot of money and it's causing too much, um, you know, too much water in that area. Do you have a misaligned head? That's an easy fix to turn around, but are you watering the street, your house? Um, did a tree grow up that wasn't there or that big when your irrigation system um, was, a, was put in? That happens a lot. And then we see there's, uh, you know, that sprinkler head is just um, smacking up against that tree and not really getting to the lawn beyond it. And also that is certainly not good for the tree. We have a lot of sand here. Go out, springtime's a good time to do it. You know, make sure none of those um, heads are clogged up. What do I mean by mismatched sprinkler heads? And this might be more of a job, but you know, that you would have to have someone come in. Um, what, you should have the same heads in each zone, the same type of heads. There should not be mixed heads, like ones that spread like this, and you know, ones that just come up. Those should all, you should have the same type of heads in each zone so that you get proper coverage. An underground leak. I work for the water department. Um, I'm not in customer service, so I don't quite handle the bills or anything like that. But if somebody uses an excessive amount of water. I usually hear about it and I look back on the notes and a lot of times it's due to an underground leak and that will ruin your day when you get that bill. Here in Hernando County, um, there are, you would have to call customer service if it's underground and there are some adjustments to the bill that you might be able to get. That's a once a year adjustment, um, but it can be extremely costly, costly. So you want to keep an eye on it. Is there like a really squishy wet area in your yard? Well worth having an irrigation contractor come out there. I promise you that it'll be cheaper than ignoring the problem in the long run. And at least once a year, you should have someone come out anyway and just do an entire e evaluation on your whole sprinkler system. Um, it will save you money in the long run. If you are here in Hernando County, this is our watering restrictions. They're right here, goes by your address. So if your address ends in a one, your watering day is Monday. And that is before eight, like that poor person I went to visit found out, or after six. And that word is or, not and. Florida Friendly Landscaping would recommend as close to that 8 a.m. as possible. That one lady had the right idea by doing it in the morning because it's healthier for your landscape for water not to sit all night and cause fungus and invite disease and all that. Um, so, you know, if it's going to take six hours, then you're going to want to start at 2 a.m. and have it, you know, finish up by 8. You may say, I'm on a private well, this does not pertain to me. Well, I have a one to we know whether or not these rules pertain to you. There is really only one question. Do you live in Hernando County? 
That's it, that's the question. If your answer is yes, then yes, these rules pertain to you. I have a private well too. These rules pertain to me, except I don't run an irrigation system. Um, so everybody up here in the Royal Highlands where I live who have wells, these rules pertain to you. Everybody in the city of Brooksville limits, you have these same rules as well, as well as all of Hernando County. So pass that on to your neighbors. <laughs> One of the other common mistakes is over planting. Um, we do that a lot because we want that instant gratification. So designing a landscape with more plants than can be adequately sustained. This picture was obviously designed, but I would say most of us, we don't go to that extreme of designing a landscape with more plants. It just happens, it happens over time because we love plants and we wanna put more plants there. You have to consider mature size. They did not consider this of these, what looks like cedar trees. That's gonna be a big mess there if that is cedar trees. You know, um, make room, leave room. Crowded plants, um, they can hide your house, which maybe you want that, but that's not great. Curb appeal um, also could be dangerous for you. You, wanna, you don't wanna create places where nefarious folks can hide. Um, so, you know, less is more when it comes to landscape design. As much as we love plants and we all tend to be hoarder culturalists when it comes to plants, sometimes we need to thin things out as well. Otherwise, because these are not gonna be healthy they're gonna be in competition with each other. It's not gonna be a good look over time. Over pruning. This is a whole class in itself, this over pruning. And I'm only showing one aspect of it. I'm showing the sheer madness of it. That's what we call this, that you have to stop the sheer madness. This is what happens to hedges when all you ever do is shear the top. Pruning is many things. Pruning is wounding. And it's a stress reaction that causes the new growth. So um, what happens here when you only ever shear the top is all the new growth is going to concentrate just at the top and get really thick there and shade out the sun from the rest of that plant. That's, if that's what's going on when you see this situation um, where it only has a little toupee over the top of the hedges and all the rest is shaded out and is dying out. There are proper ways to prune hedges. You try to do more naturally and you want to do it um, kind of in a pyramid, not, a, not an obvious triangle, but you want to make sure the bottom um, is a little wider than the top so that the sun can get through and you don't just shear the top, you, you shape it from all around. That is a whole different class, but the University of Florida does have many publications telling you how to do that. The other thing that happens with over pruning is um, our great myrtles. People love to prune those down to almost nothing. That is not healthy for the overall life of the plant. Doesn't create a good strong plant. Um, palm trees, people go crazy with palm trees too. You may have someone come to your door and say, you need to hurricane prune those palms. If you're new here, let me tell you something as someone who's been here about 43 years, hurricane pruning is not a thing. Don't fall for that. Those palms have been, they're created to go through hurricanes. They're gonna be okay. If you feel like you want the old, like that brown skirt off, Go ahead and remove that. Um, but the thing with palms is, I always do this so that you know, nine and three o'clock, don't prune anything above those. You can prune below that if you want, but you want that good, nice U-shaped. So don't go crazy with, with the pruning aspect as well. Number four, again, a series unto itself, let alone a class unto itself. But people fertilize inappropriately. People take wild guesses when it comes to fertilizing. 
Um, today is the last day in Hernando County of our blackout phase for fertilizing your lawn. So I'm going to come at you with some words of caution to not go crazy tomorrow, you know, when you're allowed to fertilize your lawn again. Um, you really have to study and know the right thing to do because it is less dangerous for your lawn to not fertilize at all than to do it wrong. So we did establish that Hernando County has a fertilizer ordinance. So January 1st through March 31st, homeowners are not allowed to fertilize their lawns. You may fertilize your vegetable garden, um, citrus tree, palm tree, things like that, but not your lawn. If you have a company that does it for you and they have a license and are permitted in Hernando County, they may apply slow release only, but really there is no need for them to have started doing that until about two weeks ago. No reason to fertilize before that time. So tomorrow you as a homeowner in Hernando County can start fertilizing, but like I said, let me, let me tell you what not to do so and what to do. Remember the label is the law. Um, that's a uh, phrase I got from my friend Jim Mall in Hernando County that we use a lot. Not only is it the law, it is scientifically proven to have the best effect if you follow it. More is not better. And don't just take, you know, a wild guess, throwing it into the spreader and, and thinking anything is good. This is a, this is a, you know, entire class unto itself. But the you know, University of Florida, they have so many thousands of publications out there on every kind of uh, landscape topic. And one of them is this one, you can find it, this link, the Florida fertilizer label. It's about a four page publication riveting reading <laughs> on the Florida fertilizer label, but it will let you know what's going on and, um, you know, how you can do it appropriately. And it explains to you what these numbers, you know, NPK, nitrogen, um, phosphorus, potassium. I wouldn't suggest these numbers actually for a turf at all. I would suggest if you can get a zero for the phosphorus, if you can get a 15, zero, 15, that'd probably be good for a lawn. 12, two, 12, balanced here and as small as possible here. That's what I would recommend um, because we already have a lot of phosphorus in our state. We have mines, <laughs> we mine phosphorus and um, it usually it promote what it promotes is fruiting. That's not what we're wanting out of a lawn. So try to get as little of that as possible. And here's another um, mistake that is made quite often. And you know, tomorrow you can fertilize. So you're going to run out to the big box store. It's going to be right in front of you as you walk in the door. Some kind of weed and feed product. Tell it no, not today. You will not fool me today. <laughs> um, University of Florida does not recommend weed and feed products, uh, at least in Florida. For one thing, it's, it's already warm. We're gonna get a strange cold front in a few days, which is very odd for April, but it's already warm, probably too warm to try and catch some of those spring weeds you should have caught maybe in February or so. Um, and um, herbicides get really, sketchy when the weather gets hot. You have to really know what you're doing and which ones to use. And the combo products just don't work well at the same time here in Florida, as well as I have personally seen um, several <clears throat> non-target organisms due to the um, herbicides in weed and feeds that end up dying. Sometimes it's a palm tree, you know, some kind of, you know, the uh, herbicide travels through the ground or whatever and gets, it does its job, it gets what's not turf, but sometimes that's not something we wanted it to kill. So it's there, these combo products don't work here in Florida.
just keep that in mind. Walk right by the weed and feed. Don't, don't let it tempt you. And there are many other things to learn about fertilizer. And I'm gonna give you some good resources at the end because I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you and it's a little bit about a lot of things, but I'm gonna help you know where to go to follow up for in there's a particular subject that you need to concentrate more on. So number five is using pesticides incorrectly. And this is the only slide I have for this because again, this could be a class unto itself. But what I'm really, why I'm using this slide is because this is of a really crummy looking lawn, isn't it? So someone, I just, um, I wasn't able to get back a hold of him, but he, he called and he was upset because he, he's trying to take over a home here in Hernando County and the lawn is bad. And he just learned about our uh, watering um, restrictions. And he so I didn't get to talk to him. I wish I could because he feels like if he watered it more, he would be able to bring the lawn back that he's purchasing in, with the home that he's purchasing. And I want to ask him, you know, how do you know watering it will fix it? Do you know what the problem is? We look at a lawn like this and that's going to be our first reaction. Oh boy, I need to water the heck out of that to bring it back. Um, probably not. Or so if they went, when that doesn't work, we think, okay, I'm going to fertilize the heck out of it to bring it back. And then when that doesn't work, we're like, I better put down some kind of insecticide um, and meanwhile, kill these weeds out that are the only things here and really try and get this lawn going. So do we know it's a water problem? Do we know it needs fertilized? What are you fertilizing? There's nothing there to fertilize. Um, do we know it's an insect problem? I just happen to know from experience the number one problem of central Florida lawns is a fungus called take all root rot. So statistically speaking, it might be pretty high chance that this lawn does have that take all root rot. Maybe, maybe not. If it does, watering is going to feed that fungus fantastically. Fertilizing it, it'll say yum, 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 yum. I love this. Uh, insecticide, going to do nothing <laughs> to a fungus. And in fact, you may kill off all your friends who were the good bugs so that the bad bugs have more of a chance to take over. So you see, it's, it's a cyclical problem that you are increasing the problem instead of fixing it. The best thing if you have a lawn like this is to take a piece of it to your county extension office here in Hernando County. I'll give you the address in a few more slides. Take a piece of half dead, half good uh, lawn, maybe eight by eight they will be able to tell you for free by looking at the roots under a microscope. If indeed you have this take all root rot and they will be able to give you advice from there. If that isn't the issue, like I know Karen had an issue that wasn't that, it was another fungus and they helped her along with what you do, you know, with that particular fungus. If it is insects, Fantastic, they'll be able to help you with that. I, I would be willing to lay money on the fact that they're not gonna tell you to water it more or to fertilize it more because that also stresses it more. You need to do many other things and they'll be able to walk you through that as well. If, they, if your company tells you you have chinch bugs, have them show you the chinch bugs because there's a lot, Years ago, it was a problem. 10 years ago, it was a problem. The county extension office has not seen very many chinch bugs in the past four or five years. So a lot of people are treating invisible chinch bugs when that's not the problem at all. So what it really comes down to is before you do anything, make sure you find out what the problem is first. You wouldn't take yourself into the doctor and say, just throw any medicine at me. I don't feel good. You want to know exactly what's wrong with you, don't you? And the same thing should apply 
to your yard and to your lawns. Here's another um, thing that should be up with the fertilizer, something new coming around the bend. It's been being researched for quite a while. This is uh, Dr. Bean here um, in the blue who is um, doing research. They started doing this research in several communities. It was on top of the world where before they put down uh, new sod, they put like a compost product down first, which helped the sod um, have, help the soil have more nutrient and water holding capacity. And after a few years, because our soil is very leachy, if you want to say that, then they would top dress the lawn with these compost products. So that's coming around the bend and it, it's turning out to be a pretty good deal. So you might wanna keep your ear and your eye out for those things. And you can compost your lawn all year long. Um, it's not counted as a fertilizer, but it's very helpful for it. Just remember less is more. I made this slide very, very simple. So it will stick in your mind. Less is more. And it reminds me again, my friend, Jim Mall, when he talks about these things, like that lawn I showed you, you think I want, to, I, I'm, with water, I wanna put more on. With fertilizer, I wanna put more on. Insecticide, I wanna put more on. And when those things don't help, what are you but a, okay, I'm not gonna go <laughs> any further with that, but just remember less is more. But, of course, I didn't leave it at five common mistakes. I always add more because I know these are the things with the people that I've dealt with here in Hernando County. Mowing too low is probably real high up there in one of the most common landscape mistakes. Your Floritan lawn should be three to four inches high. Measure it if you have to. I mean, after your company or you, mows it, it should be that high. You should not mow it any lower. That, you know, it sounds, to me, this is good news because it is so easily fixable. You start letting that lawn grow higher, your bahia should be, you know, at least four inches, not much lower. You let that lawn be higher, it's going to solve a whole lot of problems with that lawn. The roots mirror the shoots, for one thing. It'll crowd out weeds. It'll be strong, be able to photosynthesize more, have more surface to it. Um, it's just a one really easy, simple fix that no one seems to want to follow, but that will solve a lot of issues. Choosing the wrong plant for the wrong place. This, you look at it, you think it needs water. That's our first you know, choice, but maybe it was in the wrong place. I'm thinking this must be a Schefflera, like an umbrella plant. Almost looks like a rhododendron, doesn't it? So therefore it would obviously be the wrong plant in the wrong place, because you can't take a lot of those Northern plants and expect them to grow here. But if, it, if you have a plant that always looks like this, some of them are heat stressed in our summer. So I always tell people, don't believe the divas who are wilting like this in the hot summer, unless they look like that in the morning. But if you have a plant that looks like that all the time, perhaps it is a plant that enjoys a more moist location than you have it in. And you might need to change it, you know, or it might be a plant that does not grow here in central Florida. Um, you may have to find a new place for it in your yard, or you may just give up that this kind of plant doesn't grow here. So, you know, right plant, right place. Planting too low is another very common mistake. You, want, you plant a tree and wonder why it died. Um, because we tend to bury trees or shrubs or other things like that. Now this is way too deep and this magnolia judging by its leaves is doing okay, but it wouldn't in the long run. See the roots already starting to circle. This is what happens when the roots can't breathe. They're gonna start growing the wrong way, looking for oxygen. So this would end up being a very weak tree that probably will fall during a storm. When you plant a shrub or a tree, 
It has a little thing in the bottom where it flares out a little. That's called a flare. That wants to be above the ground. So, you know, if you take it out of the pot, don't plant it any deeper than it was in the pot. Again, an easy solution. It'll look a little high to you. That's okay. Planting it high is better unless you just plop it on the ground and don't <laughs> plant it at all. But um, planting it where you feel it's a little high, I promise you is going to be a little better than planting it too deeply, especially if it's an expensive tree or something like that. And the other issue is getting advice from the wrong place. The internet is fabulous, but you got to be careful with it. You might have these neighborhood Facebook groups. Dr. Lester and I watch on some of these neighborhood Facebook groups where everyone is a horticulturalist and gives everyone all sorts of advice. And, you know, we're looking at them like, okay, so where do you go? What's the best thing? Wherever your land grant university, wherever your extension office is, that's the best people to get a hold of. Here in Hernando, we have Hernando County Extension. They're trained by the University of Florida, which is our land grant university. New York Cornell is your land grant university. Uh, Penn State, University of Michigan, University of Georgia. So you, know, they, you all have one and they all should have varying degrees of people able to help you. Here in Hernando County, we have, I don't know, 70 or, or 80 volunteer master gardeners trained by Dr. Lester to be able to help answer your questions. Um, this one happens to be Bernie. He's back. He's back now at the office every Thursday. You can go in and see him and he can answer a lot of questions for you. Um, there's others as well. You can call, you can email. Um, do I have their phone number? Yes. Here you go, 352-754-4433. Contact them, contact Dr. That's the number you can find him or any master gardener or Teresa who answers the phone. If she's not ultra busy, which she usually is, she's really smart and she enjoys finding out information. She can help you quite a bit too. As well as Dr. Lester, you can find, you know, they'll find him at that same phone number. Or if you go to the Master Gardener Nursery, right now they're open Wednesdays and Saturdays, eight to noon. As it gets hotter, it might be just to 11. So call to find out their hours of operation, but you can accomplish many things there. You can get great plants and talk to great people who can give you some really good advice. Also, here's my phone number. You can call me, you can email me and <clears throat> look up Florida Friendly Landscaping online. Use these websites because some places call themselves that that aren't really affiliated with the University of Florida. Um, there's many resources. This book where I got this today's class from, put it on me so you can see it, in the Florida Friendly Guide to Plant Selection and Design. There are right now three ways you can get this book in your hand. You could look it up, just put the title in, <clears throat> and you can download it on your computer. But three ways you can get it in your hand is go to watermatters.org. That is the Southwest Florida Water Management District. Go under resources for residents, and this should be for any of you listening who are in their district. Um, they'll mail you one to your house for free. Again, you can call Teresa at that phone number here in Hernando County at the extension office and arrange to go pick one up. Or you can stop by that Master Gardener Nursery. Their address is 19490 Oliver Street in Brooksville, or call that number again to get it. Um, and they have them there. In about a month, there'll be a fourth way. I will be back at the office and you can come by my office and pick one up from me. But there are many ways to get a hold of one of those. The biggest thing I want you to remember is to embrace imperfection. It is a journey 
embrace imperfection in your yards and embrace imperfection in yourself and your ability to do these things. <clears throat> I keep mentioning these master gardeners. They're just, you know, trained volunteers. Don't let the name master throw you off because as I've heard before, the difference between a master and a novice is a master has failed many more times than the novice. So just remember that as you go along, it's supposed to be fun. And that's what we're, we're here for, to help you figure out how to do it here. And here are other resources, um, websites for Florida Friendly Landscaping. This second one, had the, as I mentioned before, the University of Florida has thousands of publications. Um, so say you wanna know more about crepe myrtle. If you type Googled crepe myrtle and put UF or University of Florida after it, you'll find all their publications. You can call a master gardener um, and Teresa or Bernie or one of the other master gardeners will be glad to help you. Maybe if it's a little tough of a question, you'll end up getting Dr. Lester who will be glad to help you as well. Or you can email or call me. And if I can't figure it out, I'll go to Bernie or to Dr. Lester or to Teresa to help me and we'll get back to you. More of my programs um, can be found on Hernando County Government YouTube. There's a specific playlist for Florida Friendly Landscaping. On the YouTube, these classes are closed captioned. So if you have a friend who's in need of that, then please you know, send them that direction. Also, I have a Facebook page where these recordings are and some other information I put in there and all of the upcoming events and classes. That's Hernando FFL program on Facebook as well as the extension office, their Facebook is Hernando EXT. If you would like a PDF copy of this, um, please go ahead and email me. It'll be on the last slide again, and I'll be glad to send you a PDF of this so you have all these words <laughs> that you can look at. And here are upcoming classes. I teach basically every week, if not more. Um, next Wednesday, we are gonna be talking specifically about lawns. So if your lawn is really just hassling you, then watch that one, the home turf advantage um, and how we can manage them in Florida friendly ways. Then through April and into March, we have a whole series on rotted, recycled and resurrected. Basically how the circle of life operates and how we can encourage it in our own landscape. Oh, and I guess I have rain barrel uh, and compost bin workshops coming up. The one next week is already full, but here are others. Um, on April 21st, I have just rain barrels, no compost bins, and it's an actual outdoor in-person workshop at the Chinsugit Conservation Center. That is not the manor house. That is the conservation center. Then in May, another virtual workshop and another outdoor one. So if you wanna know more about these, you have to email me to start the registration process. So here's my email, L-I-L-L-Y-B at hernandocounty.us. And here again is how you can get a hold of Karen or me, Lily B in HernandoCounty.us or Kay Mojica at HernandoCounty.us. And as I said, don't be afraid to email me and say, hey, could you send me a PDF of this so I can have all these words in one place um, and watch it for you. Okay, what time is it? It's a little bit after 11. Okay, let me see what we have in the chat here. Before we go, uh, let's see, people helping each other, okay. All right, crepe murder, somebody mentioned crepe murder. Yes, that's what we call the severe pruning of crepe myrtle. Yes, the phosphorus number should be 
zero, but if you can't get that, maybe a two, you know, as low as possible. Okay, do you see any other uh, chat questions I should answer? I did I not. It. Okay, I did. all right, well. I answered a few I had there too. Thank you very much, Karen. And like I said, please email, email Karen, call Karen if you have mosquito issues here in Hernando County or more questions to follow up with her. I thought it was interesting that right before she said to call her, that her phone rang. So I thought that was on purpose. I don't know. <laughs> but um, also email me. Um, we'll be here next week, 10 o'clock with the Home Turf Advantage Florida Friendly um, Lawn Care. And thank you all very much. And we will see you again next week.